Great. Well, welcome everyone, both in the room and those of you who are online with us today. Uh, welcome to the practice of art history in Britain, 1900 to 1960, Paul Oppe's Art World. My name is Sarah Turner. I'm the director at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. And it's wonderful to have uh, this gathering today. We really hope that our conferences, our research events, are moments of getting together to hear new research, to share ideas and knowledge. That's really what a research centre is all about. And really build on the work that we do here at the centre through and today particularly through our archive and library collections and share new knowledge and new ideas um, with you. And I think also we hope that conferences such as this are testing grounds. Um, we want to have them not as endpoints of research projects or um, a, a moment of kind of a, the, a, a final moment of a project, but really of an opening out to see what else is there to say, what more might be done, what other publications might emerge. So it's really in that spirit that um, I welcome you all today to really think about where we might go with this really fascinating multi-layered topic of um, the histories of art history in Britain through um, the lens of Paul Oppe. In 2017, it was a significant moment in, for the history of the Paul Mellon Centre in that um, we acquired the archive and library of Paul Oppe, um, gifted um, uh, to the nation under the acceptance in lieu scheme. And it's the first time that that, um, uh, the, that the PMC has received a collection in that way. So a very significant moment for us in our history um, as an institution and somewhere that cares for and um, disseminates knowledge um, about the, the art history um, of, of, and practice of art history um, in Britain. And I know Hans is going to say a little bit more about that um, shortly. So I do also want to just give a, my personal thank you as well to the, to the Ope family for um, their role in, um, in, in that um, donation. Um, a particular thank you to Hans Hones, who you're going to hear uh, from uh, a lot more throughout the next um, day and a half, um, who's a senior lecturer in art history at the University of Aberdeen, but also has spent um, time with us here at the centre as a research, uh, collections fellow, uh, on a research collections fellowship in 2021 to 22. And I think many of the conversations that we had then and much of the research which you see um, emerging um, and informing not only today's event, but also the drawing room display that we have downstairs. So really, Hans, we wanted to acknowledge um, the central role that you've had in helping us think through not only um, the legacies of Paul Oppe's work, but these, these larger ideas of the networks in which people practices and through which fields um, emerge. So thank you very much, Hans. And I also wanted to acknowledge the work of um, my colleagues in our archive and library, Charlotte Brunskill, our archivist, and Emma Floyd, our librarian, who are with us today. And you'll also, there'll be moments in which we can interact um, with the collection, but also have helped us shape thinking around this. And again, really thinking about the role of the Paul Mellon Centre as a place that cares for and collects the histories of art history. Um, also to Martin Myrone, who's going to chair the first session and will be a speaker, who's been um, uh, integral again to this whole project. And of course, to our events team, um, Ella Fleming and Kathleen Ward in particular, uh, and Doug Palferman, who get us in the room and make all this happen. So without further ado, again, just to reiterate a very warm welcome to you all, both here and in Bedford Square and online. Look forward to many more conversations across uh, today and tomorrow. And I'll hand over to Hans to formally introduce the topic of our event. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, <clears throat> for this very generous uh, introduction. And um, I, I start, of course, by, by echoing and repeating the thanks to the whole PMC team for putting on this conference, and Ella and Kathleen in particular. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, for a conference on a topic such as this one, on British art historiography, we do indeed have a decent turnout. I, I will admit uh, it is a topic that I am deeply, deeply invested in and interested in, but I was, I was genuinely not entirely sure whether 
whether this would uh, meet with a certain resonance. And I think the call for papers and the attendance indeed uh, shows that it seems to be a, a going concern amongst our art historical community. Um, I think I am positively surprised by this, not the least, because when some uh, art historians might read a title such as The Practice of Art History in Britain, 1900 to 1960, they might still deem this very phrase to be an oxymoron. Um, there is, of course, still a widespread opinion that the Brits, at the very best, were aristocratic dabblers when it came to art writing and had no serious expertise uh, in this subject which thrived and was born, or so they say, in the Germanic-speaking countries. I'm, I'm just quoting Anita Bruckner in, a, in an interview from 2011, so, so quite late in life. It's a conversation with Brian Sewell, by the way, uh, where, where he first um, prompted and said, it's a Germanic discipline, this is where it comes from. And Bruckner then uh, uh, acknowledged that and stated that, yes, in Germany, art history is systematic. It was scholarly. We were amateurs by comparison. It, so art history, was not native. And this remark of art history being not native almost seems to hint towards some almost deep-seated national uh, inability to engage with the matter of art uh, in a serious way. Uh, and this is something I do find uh, uh, absolutely striking because, well, this is indeed the, cu the country of, of, Charles, uh, of Charles Eastlake, John Ruskin, the great art writers of the 19th century have uh, um, filled libraries with critical literature about their work. Uh, and so has uh, the attention for uh, the new art history since the 1970s. However, we do have this black hole, as it seems to me, in historiography of uh, where, where British art writing of the first half of the century, between roughly speaking 1900 and 1960, doesn't seem to have received a great amount of critical uh, attention. And I hope today's conference and tomorrow's uh, uh, papers, of course, as well, can, can help a little bit to start, to start thinking about this omission in the historiographic record, to think about this black hole of art writing of the first half of the 20th century. I'm not even saying that the, the belief that there was no substantive British art historical tradition in that period is completely wrong. I think it is, of course, absolutely fair to say that within universities, at least, the subject did not have a terribly strong standing. I think it's equally fair to say that uh, the big methodological debates about what the subject is did not happen on this island, but rather elsewhere. And one, of course, uh, kind of depend, uh, is, is counter-dependent with the other. Uh, the lack of uh, a comparatively smaller university system and the lack of academic departments for art history, of course, also resulted perhaps in a less explicit professional reflection about the field and its methods. But that, and I think the, the, the papers uh, and our program uh, already indicate that, that does not indicate that there is, should not indicate that there was no art writing. And I hope that this conference can go some distance in the way of trying to rediscover some of the practitioners and uh, priorities of British art writers in that period. Uh, in that sense, I think my, my, my hopes for this conference are, are quite, quite, quite humble and basic on many respects. First, I think we can, over these next two days, make some steps towards a more comprehensive prosopographic treatment of British art writing. Who were the people who practiced art history in this period? What did they do? Where were they educated? Which forums, which networks did they frequent? But these basic who, what, when questions, I think, still deserve to be put to the fore. Something that the Germanic tradition has done since at least 100 years. So I remind you Wilhelm Wetzold's famous book on Deutsche Kunsthistorie, German art historians, came out in, in 1921, displaying this pride in a national disciplinary tradition. That definitely has no equivalent in Britain, uh, neither from the 1920s nor, I think, uh, from the 2020s. Uh, and connected with that, I hope that we can think about, well, praxeology, about practice, about what these individuals who researched art actually did, how they worked, where they worked, which resources, libraries, epistolary networks, 
reference collections uh, they used for their daily comings and goings. And I hope that this is some of the groundwork that we can lay here over the next two days to think about the professionalization of art history in that period or the lack thereof, maybe. And I, 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 I'm keen to keep, keep an open mind here, even though my personal stance is, of course, maybe you know, there is more of a professional story to be told than commonly acknowledged. Um, we're doing so through the lens, as Sarah has already indicated, through the lens of the life and writings of Paul Oppe, and I'm, I'm delighted that uh, today's conference is the next stepping stone, at least, in a longer conversation that we are having amongst each other for a few years now. I think we did a, a first workshop on Oppe's life and writings in... October 21, is that maybe right? It was after COVID, I do remember that, after the first waves where we first came together to, to, to speak about his, his, his life and career. And I think he is a, an absolutely fascinating figure because almost like, almost like a prism, I think he, 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 he combines a wide realm of potential areas of expertise and practice of art writing in Britain. Uh, he was, of course, a famed collector of British works on paper. He was a popular art historian, if you want, who wrote about the Renaissance greats, such as Raphael and Botticelli. He also periodically was a museum administrator who was seconded to the V&A to think about the institution's financial stability and, and things like that. But he always also remained something that's often called a minor figure somebody who was not at the heart, not a catalyst of discourse, not an Anthony Blunt or Kenneth Clark, but somebody who was well-connected, in touch with everybody in the field, yet not at the heart of a disciplinary discourse of professionalization. And I hope by studying the life and work of such figures as Oppe, we can actually, from the bottom up maybe, get a more realistic and holistic picture of what happened in British art writing in the first half of the uh, 20th century, within institutions, but also beyond institutions. That's my few words of introduction. I hope the papers that follow can fill them with life. I hand over to Martin to introduce me quickly again, I believe, which is a bit... <laughs> Yeah, this is, this, is, this is your 30 second pause, hands before you start up again. Um, yes, hello, I'm Martin Murray, and I'm Head of Grants, Fellowships and Networks here at the Paul Mellon Centre, um, and it's my pleasure to uh, chair this opening session of the conference um, Art History as a Profession. We have a full um, afternoon, uh, and we're going to follow, I think, a, a similar format um, through the uh, three sessions this afternoon, which is to hear the two papers in succession um, and then have a chance for Q&A, uh, both from within, within the room and as maybe fed through um, online from our online audience as well. Um, so I will uh, be introducing Hans and then Sarah, but I will start. You've got to come back again now, you see? By introducing um, Hans Honnes, who we've already heard, a senior lecturer in art history at the University of Aberdeen, who's published very uh, extensively on historiography, on art historiography, including work on uh, Wolflin, on antiquarianism, on migration and art history, and a new biography, I've got to plug it, new biography um, of A.B. Vorberg, uh, published by Reaction Books in spring 2024. 1st of March, 2024 off the press. Um, and as has been mentioned, he was a research collections fellow here at the centre in 2021 to 2022. And, he's, and uh, we've had the uh, uh, great um, pleasure of being able to uh, draw on Hans's research in, uh, actually this is the second display in the drawing room, um, exploring the collections here um, in the most kind of interesting and wide ranging way. Um, he's also the author of, a, I think, a really kind of pivotal article on the Clark-like the Clark -like identity of art historians in British art studies, which I suspect, or actually I refer to it, I suspect it's gonna be referred to a number of times today. Um, but with that, I think over to you, Hans. Thank you so much, Martin. <clears throat> Hello again, after my short break. I hope I managed to, yes, I managed to put the slides on and I hope to recoup a couple of minutes uh, of the time that's already ticking. So uh, I, I, I thought, no, no, God, I, I, I put myself to the beginning of the conference and that is not entirely uh, intentional, of course, but I think also chronologically, it was quite suitable because I am actually going to speak about some of the early years of Paul Oppe, the beginnings of his career in many respects. Um, 
I find it a fascinating and understudied period of his life because it, in many respects, captures the period before Oppe was actually an art historian. Uh, as many of you might know, he originally trained as a classicist and also succeeded in this field uh, quite, quite, quite well, um, publishing papers on the chasm of Delphi, for example, so about mythology and Greek religion, and he also managed to hold academic posts in this subject. Um, in 1902, Arpe was appointed assistant to John Burnett, who was professor of Greek at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. And with this appointment, Oppe achieved something that essentially was a bit like gold dust in British academia at the time. Earlier in the introduction, I spoke about the fact that the subject had little to no academic credentials, no base within the university systems, very few established chairs or even, or let alone uh, more, more junior lectureships in the subject. However, Oppe's appointment allowed him precisely to do this one thing that so many of his peers failed to do, namely to teach academically about the history of art. Early on in his time at St. Andrews, he indeed put on a whole course that was devoted to the history of Greek sculpture. Here in 1904, I'm putting on the syllabus, and you can also see that downstairs in the lecture theater. Um, the fascinating thing about this course is that he approached the topic of Greek sculpture not from an archaeological, maybe not even from an art historical or positivist angle, but rather from a far-reaching philosophical and at times slightly impressionistic take on the history of Greek sculpture. Even though all the lectures are, of course, devoted to individual problems in Greek sculpture, uh, sculpture in relief, sculpture in the round, tomb reliefs, and so on. This was far from a positivist iteration through the history of Greek art, but rather a far-ranging aesthetic meditation about art and sculpture as a whole. We find, for example, musings about the differences between painting and sculpture, excursuses about Michelangelo or Mantegna, Morosini's horses and the interest in art it shows, the ugliness of modern movement and the ineffectual use of the body, some side remarks about the golf swing and what have you not, uh, some maybe not as humorous comparison as he thinks about uh, happiness and knitting one sock and what I leave the quotes to you. Um, the point I want to get to is that this was a man who really had the opportunity to make history of art part of his professional identity. Surely he would have still had to lecture on Greek metrics and poetry and what have you, but the history of art in this far-ranging mode was definitely part or within his remit as Greek historian. And yet, Oppe decided in the end, well, not in the end, quite quickly actually, in 1905, against an academic career. He quit his position. Uh, in the meantime, in 1904, by the way, he had been appointed lecturer in Greek history at Edinburgh University, a very prestigious appointment, yet one that he gave up after less than a year. Uh, that certainly had many reasons. Um, one of them, and perhaps the key reason, being that the type of academic history that this post entailed, so the serious, positive, empirical setting that such a position demanded, was at odds with uh, Oppe's own desires and beliefs. Um, his uh, um, inaugural lecture uh, at, at Edinburgh was entitled A Plea for Life and Colour in Historical Writing. And here he made quite evident that he thinks that the historian requires pr primarily imaginative sympathy and the breath of poetry. The poet is the one who can change the perception of history and not some fact monger who is just compiling lists of source texts and whatnot. Oppe is, by the way, very conscious of the fact that this goes counter to what most of his colleagues at Edinburgh would have uh, advocated for, who would think such an approach as inadequate because it is too poetical. 
Here we have a problem emerging. For Paul Oppe, a very young man in 1905, the academic setting of being a professional historian clearly seemed primarily stifling. What he aspired to, instead of being one of the scrupulous historians, a school of historians that has arisen in the last decades and have actually uh, praised factual accuracy above everything else, this school of history clearly to him stood against the desires of a contemporary and artistic life. Time and again in his diaries of the period Ope muses about his deep felt desire to actually transform his life through art into an artistic life. What then do I want, he's writing in 1904. All day, today, and generally, I long to paint, or I wish to be a poet, and to express in a form not inadequate some of the emotions and thoughts which make up my real life. I want to be contemporary, he writes. And he time and again hopes that this maybe, perhaps, can be realized by writing something like an art book, but clearly more about aesthetics, but certainly not by engaging with the uh, uh, stifling ways of writing history. An aesthetic, an artistic life. Time and again, in the lectures about Greek sculpture, this anti-historicist stance comes through already. Uh, here in, in, in St. Andrews in 1904, he already writes, for example, against museums, whom he deems necessary for the education of artists, and he shall be the last to deny it. But he also, again, sees museums simply as a repository that, that divorces art from real life, from art as a heartfelt and enriching existence. In short, Ope seems somebody who increasingly became disenchanted by the world of academic analysis. Now, the tempting thing here, of course, I think, probably for all of us, and for me to an extent as well, is to conclude that this is precisely evidence of the British dilettante mindset. A man who is maybe steeped in the writings of Ruskin and who wants to use art as an ethical elevation of self instead of the subject of sound historical studies. But I do wonder whether this, this juxtaposition, here the Germanic seriousness, there the British dilettante, whether this, this juxtaposition really holds up and stands up. I find it striking that at the same time that Oppe was writing these lines, we have also in Germany a wide range of writers, a wide range of scholars who argue for art writing in a similar vein as OP did. Not necessarily as a historic exercise, but as a dilettantish exercise. And who saw precisely in this, dilett in this dilettantism a source of greater, yeah, greater artistic efficacy that is brought to your life. I'm just quoting, for example, Karl Einstein, one of, the, one of the famed art writers of this period, author of a pioneering monograph on African sculpture, but also on Georges Braque, and indeed one of the standard textbooks of art of the 20th century. Well, Einstein in, in 19, uh, oh, 19, I have the date, 10, also published a novella uh, called Bebuka or The Dilettantes of the Miracle, a book where he bullishly and actively tried to reclaim a term, a pejorative term sometimes, such as the dilettante, and tried to turn precisely this verdict of a non-scientific art writer into something positive as an, a way of immediate, instantaneous reconnecting with real life through art a life that allows us to regain some of the enchantment that Oppe and Einstein too were precisely missing in the contemporary world. Einstein writes here, we don't sacrifice anymore. The sublime gets lost. You criticize the miracle. The miracle only has a purpose when it's real, but you have destroyed all powers that go beyond humanity. Here the idea is again that a non-scientific, dilettantish approach to art 
can help us again to go precisely beyond humanity. What I want to highlight here is that this dichotomy, here the serious germ, there's the dotas of British art writing, probably doesn't stand up to better scrutiny. But that the place of art writing was still debated quite controversially, even in Germany at the time, and that we don't have any issue to find voices whose agenda resonates quite directly with what somebody like Oppe would have defended in his lectures and diary entries of 1905. Think again also about the, 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 the uh, criticism of museums. I can quote a text here like Karl Hillebrand's famous 12 letters by an aesthetic heretic, uh, where he uh, complains about museums that want to do something for the people. But what people do by actually cultivating museums is to put artworks in art prisons that look more similar to railway stations than palaces, which the people will never enjoy. And there is indeed a, a sizable tendency in German academia at the time that advocates against art history as a historic inquiry and instead for a general science of art, as Max Dessois famously termed it in his project of an Allgemeine Kunstwissenschaft. An approach to art that is precisely more aligned with philosophy, with philosophical aesthetics, with anthropology perhaps, even with prehistoric archaeology and things like that, but not necessarily an empirical, historical study of art. And I do wonder to what extent exactly such movements, such anti-historical attempts to write the history of art or to think about art, also found a, a positive reception in Britain at the time. Um, Oppe's close colleague and friend, uh, Gerard Baldwin Brown, uh, the chair of fine art at Edinburgh University, for example, published in 1891. This textbook uh, titled The Fine Arts, the motto being that beauty is the truth of art. Uh, 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 clearly a statement aligned again with this strong aestheticist credo that we also see in the writings of, say, Einstein or Deswar and indeed Oppe. And in a book like that, we find more you know, anthropological reflections about the origins of art, about the reasons for art, and an attempt to bring the study in art in close touch with disciplines such as psychology or prehistoric archaeology. Uh, I've shown the next slide here before, but I just want to bring it in again out of, out of local pride. Uh, that, for example, this idea also informed what I believe is the first university degree in, uh, fine, in the history of fine art at the British University, namely the degree in fine art history and theory that was launched at Aberdeen University in 1921. Uh, I could go on about that, uh, but I won't here today. I just want to highlight that again. This is an attempt to merge theory of art together with principles and history of the different disciplines across periods such as ancient art and modern art. So a much, much more expansive, a much, much more philosophical and aesthetic take on art history than what we are commonly used to see as the successful model uh, for our discipline. And I think this, this helps us to an extent to question <laughs> simply whether history of art, as we know it today, was without alternative throughout its history. My strong feeling is that in the early 20th century, at the time when somebody like Oppe had to decide on whether to pursue an academic career or not, this question as to what the study of art should be was much, much more open than we often credit it to be in retrospect. Of course, as we all know, in Britain, the historical tradition, the Warburg tradition of if you want, it won. It is the one that rose to the top, that, that, that um, permeated uh, most university departments to one extent or another. But such historical triumph does not, of course, mean that there were not alternatives available and present within the discourse of the time. For Oppe, Clearly, this idea that art should not be studied as an empirical historical subject meant an unreconcilable conflict with his status as a salary academic. The big question, of course, for him in that moment was, 
what to do instead, what to become if you don't pursue the career that you've been qualified for, uh, and what to do if you are not a classicist. Um, <laughs> In the years around 1904, 1905, we see Oppe darting around between different options. Uh, for a time, he clearly aspired to become a journalist, uh, mainly writing reviews, and he, he wrote dozens upon dozens of reviews, mainly of novels for more kind of middle-brow publications like The Sketch. Uh, but that, too, was something where he quickly got disillusioned. Right again, I grudge the time spent on reading the indifferent novels which appear and trying to appraise them justly. There to an editor, he said, well, I would happily, of course, review books on art, but clearly that type of work didn't come his way. Which highlights one aspect, I think, that that's often also kind of left out of these discussions about the history of a discipline. Namely, that a lot of these deliberations as to where to take your career were, of course, also motivated by financial ones. Uh, in, in his diary in 1906, Arpey mused, for example, that we all require a reasonable subsistence, that we all need to make money. <sighs> Yet also, uh, <laughs> don't we all, yeah. <laughs> uh, but also uh, voicing the hope that this is, this is not the sole value of a man, but that, that rather connections and the, the worthiness of one's work in its own right um, should, should, should be deemed enough. And I think that's exactly where we see an issue, a conflict, a, 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 a rub between this exalted idea of art as something that, that, that rejuvenates us, that uplifts us, that is this higher form of existence, and the, 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 the hope to make a professional career out of these virtues, out of these subjects. As soon as you professionalize your existence as any kind of art writer, well, you of course also become exactly that, a professional who works within the constraint and frameworks of an economic world, which precisely leads time and again for poor Oppe into these double binds. Uh, he then tries for a while to become a, 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 a scholar, a, a writer of popular art books, writes a book on Raphael, which gets published in 1909, Something again that made his life much, much better and that he approached with considerable scientific rigor, passing through all the literature on Raphael. Uh, but again, I think I, I, it's fair to say that the end product clearly sat between different chairs. Uh, on the one hand side, for some of the reviewers who were looking for entertaining literature on art, it was not entertaining enough. Too much of this serious research. While for some others, Heinrich Wörfling, for example, well, it was just the book of an art writer who made certain observations in front of certain images and who brings out things, but without engaging with the historical or critical literature. Not boring, not without judgment, but in a way that makes it clear that he imagined an audience that is not an audience of art historians. That's fair to say, he probably did not want to write specifically for art historians, but for a wider audience. But precisely in these attempts of actually finding a, an economic existence as an art writer, he also didn't manage to service any of the markets in between. Um, in the end, that's just my end point here, in the end he decided to become a civil servant worked in the Department of Education for the remainder of his career from 1905. Uh, one of his friends of St. Andrews pithily remarked that this had many advantages, such as lots of spare time and a constant supply of excellent stationery. Um, and Ope seems to have taken this job in exactly this vein, as something that secured him the menial side of life, the, the, the income that's needed to live a life and also to collect art, for example, while on the other hand side to preserve the realm of art, this exalted sphere of existence uh, for something that is, well, just that, an amateurish pursuit, a hobby. Not amateurish in the sense of bad or unprofessional, but relegated to a different sphere of life that was not tainted and not shaped by the frameworks of a profession. What does that teach us about art history and its practices around 1900? Well, I think it, more than anything, teaches us that it is an occupation that was not easily squared at the time with any sort of professional uh, uh, occupation. Um, 
the, the, the fact that somebody like Ope did not find a professional career within art history is, however, not necessarily born out of ignorance or born out of an inability to find a, a future in the field. It clearly also is indicative that alt-ac, as we would call it today, so alternatives to academic careers, was a choice deliberately taken by someone who simply wanted to pursue their love and interest in art in a different ways than the economic frameworks of his life uh, presented himself. And I think we have to take exactly these decisions seriously. Uh, as, as professional art historians, as people who work at universities, I think we all often have a certain confirmatory bias. We became professional art historians. We trained long for that. We decided it very hotly for the sake of nice conferences and a slightly uh, above national average salary, which is grand and wonderful. Um, but that sometimes also makes us a bit kind of tunnel vision, you know, blind for the fact that there might be people out there who desire something else for their life and career and who indeed might forge a path that allows them to shape their profession and their interest in art in an alternative way. And this is where I stop. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Hans, for getting us started at the beginning, really, in terms of date and in terms of um, OPE as a kind of starting point for all the thinking that we're doing today um, and in the, the themes that you're introducing there. Now, um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Cobiello. But I've not met, so hello, Sarah. I'm sorry, I didn't get the chance to say hello before. So I was looking around, saying, I assume you're here, but you are here. Fantastic. Because <laughs> otherwise that would have been a bit awkward. Um, Sarah uh, received her PhD from the Vorberg Institute uh, with an AHRC funded thesis on art historians as collectors in the 20th century. Um, she is currently further investigating the panorama of British art historians uh, thanks to the support of a uh, uh, Getty Library grant. And in 2018, she was a fellow at the Calust. Gulbenkian Museum researching Kenneth Clark's role as Gulbenkian's advisor. And I like this. She, she is also an enthusiastic member of the Society of the History of Collecting, brackets, steering committee, Italian chapter. Which all sounds vaguely Masonic, but I think that's kind of exciting. Um, so, uh, and Sarah, and uh, Sarah is talking today on being an art historian in Britain at 1920s to 1950s, Clark, Nicholson, and Dennis Brown. Okay, over to Sarah. Um, so, well, thanks for all the organizers inviting me to speak here. Um, the title of my talk actually refers to an article by Caroline Elam on becoming an art historian in the 1930s that was published in 2004, which was a pivotal exploration of the art history world of the time, seen through the experience of Benedict Nicholson, of whom I will be speaking today, and reconstructing it from his diaries, which are actually held here. Um, shifting and almost bouncing between the theme of being an art historian and becoming an art historian from the late 1920s up until the late 1950s, my aim today is to investigate three main practices in art history, such as lecturing, exhibiting, and writing slash publishing. And that, as we shall realize, these are very much intertwined. We will be exploring the cases of Kenneth Clark, Dennis Mahone, and Benedict Nicholson, making references to personal objects from their art collection for each one of them as a further tool to understand their collector's professional practice. So let's start with Kenneth Clark, and I will begin with a small round portrait of a bearded man by Raphael, which was the inner lid cover decoration of a wooden box that was once in the collection of Kenneth Clark, now it's in a private collection, and here is a photo of how it was displayed in his house in Hampstead around the 19, in 1947. Clark had bought the piece around 1928, and intrigued by its subject and its attribution, immediately started researching the object. The result was an article which he had written for the benefit of students conceived as a showcase of good method which combined visual analysis and description, connoisseurship, but also extensive archival research. The clue cool finding, in fact, was that there was a source where the sitter could be, so that the sitter could be identified as the godfather of Raphael's daughter. 
as mentioned, in an inventory of a famous collection in Vicenza, the Gualdo Collection. As I had the occasion to investigate for my doctoral thesis, the article remained unpublished, but Clark's findings were soon to be divulged to a larger public, for it was going to be lent to the 1930 exhibition in London dedicated to Italian art. Um, this um, exhibition actually uh, Kenneth Clark was involved in its organization, and it was the sort of crying of his recent entrance uh, for the, of Kenneth Clark in the London art scene uh, that had followed his involvement with the Burlington Fan Arts Club and the History of Art Society, and um, which followed his praised work for the cataloging of the Leonardo drawings in the Royal Collection. Clark was in charge of helping with the catalog, he was in selection committee, and he was also part of the hanging committee, and Clark really enjoyed um, staging the act of hanging. Um, Clark, however, has been described as a clever, articulate, Oxford-educated Anglo-Saxon. He was the heir of a cotton industry tycoon who had studied at Oxford which in, within the years of 1923 and 1925, he studied history, history, and there he learned the importance of writing and looking at documents, which will be persistent throughout his whole career. His, history, his interest in the arts was encouraged by the vicinity of the Ashmole Museum, where the keeper of fine art department, Charles Bell, had become a mentor for him. At the time, in Britain, art history was still struggling to becoming an academic subject being some 30 years behind some countries such as Austria or Italy and Germany. Um, although possibly now we are sort of dis discovering that the chronology might be changing. Um, Bell initiated Clark, making him study from live the drawings of Raphael and Michelangelo from the collection of the Ashmolean, training him in direct contact with the works of art an essential, never enough, enough stress feature of the formation of an art historian, as pursued by his predecessors and as fostered by Clark himself, also as a teacher of, um, of his own students. Bell also took Clark to visit many public and private collections, and this culminated in a summer trip in 1925 to Italy, where they first stopped at Bologna, where Bell's still Victorian taste made Clark appreciate the then disregarded art of the Karachi, and then they followed on to Tuscany, where they stayed in Poggio Gerardo in Florence, and there Clark met uh, Berenson for the first time. Just two encounters sophist Berenson uh, to invite Clark to work, uh, to collaborate uh, with him, and uh, he proposed him the task to revision his legendary um, lists of Florentine drawings. Clark's accepted on the condition that he would start one year later, allowing him to finish the fourth year at Oxford, where he was um, working on a project on, go on the Gothic revival, which had been suggested by Bell. In 1926, after a three months trial at Itati, Clark moved to London, where he joined the, the Burlington Fine Arts Club, which maybe we will be um, hearing about today. And uh, there he became friend with Roger Fry. He was introduced to the Bloomsbury Group. During this time, Berenson instructed Clark to do some preparation before he came to Itati. This consisted in, again, seeing as many galleries and collections live as possible in the UK and outside, and to learn languages, especially German. Berenson wanted Clark to read Regal and Wolflin in original. So in the end, Clark went off and spent two months in Dresden, and from there he visited the collections, he attempted to learn German, and he did some further traveling. Before starting at Itati, working on the Florentine drawings, he continued traveling Italy, looking at the collection and getting training with them, seeing objects in Bergamo, which is where Berenson had his conversion to connoisseurship, Brescia, Trento, Padua, Parma, and then in Rome. In the period between 1927 and 1930, which is the period in which Clark buys the Raphael Tondo, which I've showed you earlier, he engages the most with Raphael. And he represents, this represents a further point in the career in the UK for him. 
1927, he marries Elizabeth Winthrop Jane Martin, and after a period of living in Florence with her, visiting collections with her, doing more work and more training with the Berenson, they then return to London. In 1929, he gets the call to work at the aforementioned Italian exhibition of 1930. And whilst he was in Rome, another key fact happened. He attended a lecture by A.B. Warburg at the Artian in Rome, which is recalled and pictured as representative of Clark's infatuation with the wider and innovative approach associated with the Warburg and the Warburgians, which is a relationship that would actually span for all his life. In 1929, uh, Clark makes a start in the curatorial world. So again, he chooses a, a different path from the academic um, historian or the art writer for its own. Um, he was commissioned to catalogue the Leonardo da Vinci drawings at Windsor Castle, which was a perfect task given his training with Berenson and at the Ashmolean. So here we are, back in 1930, during the Italian exhibition, where Clark has his Raphael displayed in a case next to medals we actually, that actually portray the sitter of the portrait, which was the uh, um, engraver and metal worker Valerio Belli from Vicenza. Shortly after the opening of the exhibition, Clark was still working on that article that he had envisioned for students, and he contacted the closest expert of um, Raphael that he knew, which was Paul Lopez. Um, Ope, as Hans Christian just showed, uh, had published a monograph on the artist, and apparently, at least for Clark, it was considered a, a good reference work. Let's put it that way. Um, Ope uh, had just given one of the lectures complimentary to the exhibitions in the Royal Academy on the Raphael cartoons, which is where also Clark lectured for the first time. This marked the official start for Clark of a great career as a lecturer, becoming what Gertrude Bing had called the Toscanini of diapositives. For Clark, as for other scholars before and after him, lecturing had become a sort of laboratory for his scholarly work, which he would then turn into some of his most famous books. His style has been described as accessible for any kinds of public, but also at times irritating, as Pevster once said, for its captivating and somehow vague statements. Meanwhile, his curatorial career was carrying on, for the better. In 1931, he was offered this to succeed Bell at the Ashmolean, and as Paul Lope had predicted to him in a letter of conversation, he then went on to the National Gallery in 1933-1944, becoming its youngest director of in, the, in its history. In 1934, Clark also became the surveyor of the King's Pictures, and it was really the start of what, it was being called, what has been called the Great Clark Bloom, Boom. His book on Leonardo drawings that he published in 1935 had established his reputation as a serious scholar, and it again resulted from a series of lectures that he gave at Yale. A, pre a predominant figure in the public art world, Clark did more and more lecturing, especially after the war. Embedded in the most interpretive, interpretative power of English literature tradition, following the examples of Pater, Ruskin, Berenson, and indeed Fry, with a sweet tooth for visual analysis between culturally and chronologically different works, Clark's lecture expressed a wide range of interests for history, literature, iconography, showing the width of his, of his approach and a mix, really, of different art historical approaches, and the influence of the recent activity of both the Cold War and the Warburg Institutes. In this respect, the three years of his late prof professorship at Oxford are representative. Given once a week, they form the basis for many of his books, and as in the case of the first cycle that he dedicated to landscape paintings, which was then turned in landscape into art. Ranging from the Renaissance Italian artists such as Alberti, Paolo Uccello, Piero della Francesca, Raphael, to the end of humanism, Rembrandt, Angre and Delacroix, art and photography, error in art, these lectures embodied Ruskin's original aim to interest youth, in this case students, and it really did so. There was no academic art history at Oxford yet, and the lectures were well attended. On the morning after each lecture, Clark was offered a room where to receive students for 
questions and consultation. And as some of these students later recalled, this sometimes was their first point of awareness and interest for the history of art. As we will probably, and also uh, he had, a, um, one could say, a passion for including his own works in his lectures as well, which, as I deem, also stand for the close relationship between his collection and his professional work. As we will probably hear today many times, although I'm the first one for the moment, well, after Hans Christian, um, the journey for the establishment of, art, of academic art history as a subject or as a degree was still rather ongoing and long, despite the turning points of the foundation of the Courtauld Institute and the arrival of the war between 1931 and 1933. As also Gombrich often said, there was an art history tradition before, it's not that it was invented at that moment, and also as Elizabeth Sears and also recently Hans Christian um, have thoroughly researched uh, into the history of these early institutes the aim of the court was to train those who want to specialize either as art historians, teachers, museums, and galleries official. And these aims were very similar for what has happened, for instance, in Italy with the birth of the so-called Scuola di Specializzazione of Adolfo Venturi in Rome in 1901. The ideas for programs and syllabuses and the plans for an integrated court and Warburg approach were very promising. They had the resources, libraries, photo libraries, museums and galleries nearby, and trained academic staff. But the results were slower to be seen, and the reputation takes, took longer to build. If we make a generational jump to see, sorry, I just lost my um, track, um, to see um, what was the world of art history like in the 1930s then, when Dennis Mahone and Benedict Nicholson were formating as art historians and was, was, were pursuing a career in art history, um, as was explored by, Carol, by Carolyn Elam, um, we are going to see that they're being in contact with direct, that they're being in direct contact with institutions uh, such as the Courtauld and the, and the Warburg sorry, I keep continuing losing my stuff, and the Warburg Institute, um, we will see, sorry, I'm not used to this, okay. Um, we will see that there are many continuities with the earlier period, but also um, their contact with the, the institutions and the, and the, fi the figures uh, involved with the formalization of the history of art in Britain such as important Anglo-Saxon scholars like Bernard Berenson, American German-speaking scholars, and also Italian scholars, resolved into a very fertile, interconnected approach that had a long impacting um, effect well outside Britain. So once again, I'm going to speak of Dennis Mahone, but through one of the objects that he owned. Um, this is a painting by Guercino, Jaco Blessing the Sons of Joseph. It now is in the National Gallery in Dublin. And it was acquired by Mahone in 1934 in Paris for only 120 pounds. In 1934, Mahone, who had studied history at Oxford and who had stayed a further year to, I quote, read a little art history under the direction, the direction of Sir Kenneth Clark at the Ashmolean, end of quote, and who had advised him to read Wolflin, like Berenson did at this time with him, and was going to apply for a position at the National Gallery where Clark was then director. So he wrote to Clark in 1934 inquiring about this vacancy. Mahone had also informed at the same time Clark of his recent purchase and had offered to exhibit it at the Burlington House for an exhibition, but Clark refused it for it would not fit, it was too big. Clark eventually will have also to decline the offer of Mahone to offer a Guercino to the National Gallery, stating that it would, be, it would be impossible to convince the trustees. The taste was not raped there yet for, for the Seicento art and especially for Guercino. This letter from, Clark, from Mahone to Clark, dated 1935, however, is also interesting because it reveals 
that since Macron did not get this vacancy which was given to another candidate, he asked Clark if he could still join the National Gallery as a sort of unpaid trainee, inventing possibly what has become then the honorary attaché for the National Gallery, a post from, who, from which many other, peop, uh, many other colleagues of my own will benefit, including Ben Nicholson and John, and John Pope Hennessy. In his letter, Mahon sets out his craving for physical learning in the museum world, his, for hands-on experience at close encounter with the artworks, and a hunger that recently the court hall was not able to satisfy completely, despite he was and, would, and wanted to still continue to attend lectures, especially on the Seicento art. Mahon, as well, was the heir of a Guinness Mahon merchant bank family. He had studied at Eton, then at Oxford. Already in 1933, he attended the lectures at the court hall, being particularly grateful for the attention on Seicento art and the work and influence of Pevsner, but also Anthony Blunt, especially as far as art theories was concerned. He continued to attend private lessons with Pevsner that he would pay with his own personal uh, monthly income, and he started touring galleries, collections, and museums and archives. As Pevsner had suggested him, he started working on Guercino, and then Mahon came back to London and started his traineeship at the National Gallery after he had gone to Italy studying all the Guercinos and delving into all the archives and the sources. Um, and once at the National Gallery, he actually repeated his traineeship for a further two years, this time at the same time as Ben Nicholson. In London, um, Mahone very much attending the Warburg Institute, where he worked with friends such as Otto Kurz, Rudolf Wittkover, and also later Luigi Salerno. In 1947, this resulted in the publication of Seicento Art, Studies in Seicento Art and Theory, which was sponsored by the Warburg Institute. In 1948, a rather shy Mahone wrote to the elderly and established Bernard Berenson, I quote, I heard from the Warburg Institute that you had expressed interest in the book. And so I picked up my courage and I sent it to you. On that occasion, Mahone uh, gave a rather vivid account of his education to Berenson, which I, I used for the earlier um, summary that I introduced before. Um, in these letters, Berenson also asked Mahone for some photos of his Seicento pictures, probably one third of all the Seicento pictures that one can find um, in Berenson's photo library. That included also the Guercino that was, that I showed you before, that was illustrated in this um, 1947 publication. The Seicento art and theory book that Mahone produced was sponsored by Saxel, as he told Berenson, and he's still considered a fundamental study for Baroque and for the history of art in general as this recent um, study of the fundamental books of the re rediscovery of the Seicento um, shows. But in the 1950s, Mahone input into the international scenario was definitely also through exhibition making. Both as a scholar, as an organizer, and as a generous lender, Mahon contributed to the most pivotal shows and occasions to study and reevaluate the Bologna Seicento School in collaboration with um, Cesare Nudi in Bologna. The 1950s were the rather, was a rather fertile ground for the rediscovery of Seicento art in all its shades, classicism, Caravaggism, in all Europe. If the initiators of this path were German scholars such as Voss and the Italians, especially Roberto Longhi, as Mahone himself remembered, Britain certainly held a role in keeping the debate vivid and fostering it further, and Mahone was one of the key figures, together with Ben Nicholson, especially thanks to the latter, to the latter's editorship of the Boleto magazine. And there was a strong tradition of Seicento studies already way before, if we think about Alice Waterhouse, for instance, or, and then also later with um, Francis Haskell. Since Nicholson became editor in, the 19, in 1945, 1947 of the Burlington Magazine, his editorials uh, touched upon themes such as art history, 
teaching, art historiography, history of conservation, conservation and scholarship generated through exhibition. The climate of the 1950s is perhaps most um, best summarized by the example of the 1951 pivotal exhibition on Caravaggio that was organized by Roberto Longhi. Mahon visited, visited it four times and Nicholson was among the most enthusiastic recipient of the opening of this of these opening of new fields of inquiries and new fields of studies. The Caravaggio mania, as it has been described, um, spread across the pages of the Burlington magazine uh, where newly discolored do documents and evidence were being published and there was a focus on new chronology and reshaping the catalog. Nicholson, also through the agency of Clark, made it possible that important Italian voices joined the debate, including Roberto Longhi, but also Roberto Pallucchini, Rodolfo Pallucchini. If Mahone was more integrate, intrigued by Caravaggio, Nicholson was, all, was more for the Caravaggio side of the Seicento, not just Italian, but especially European. This is a painting by Terbruggen that Nicholson um, possessed, and he also wrote a monograph on Terbruggen in 1958. This painting was acquired in 1954. It's now in the Fitzwilliam collection, it's, and it's only one out of eight paintings by Terbruggen in the UK public collection. In 1990, it was chosen to illustrate um, Nicholson's great um, publication and task of cataloging uh, the international Caravaggio movements. And this monumental work had been published posthumously by Luisa Vertova with Feiden, and then it bore a foreword by um, Anthony Blunt. Clearly, burning out of the Berenssonian indexing list, it was a monumental work that still is a reference for the field of the Caravaggesque movement. And it was carried out in a monumental indexing and taxonomy fashion, following the current um, tendency in British art history of the time. It was not just a list of attribution, and it hid enormous connoisseurship and sources work Behind it, it even had a chart of visual data. And I'm just going to um, conclude. It incorporated the German and the Italian lesson on the appreciation of the Seicento and the Caravaggesque, and it was beautifully written in the best English art writing tradition, as Anthony Blatt underlined. Just having a quick glance at this formation, at Blatt's formation again, we see Oxford, Honoraria Tache at the National Gallery, working with Berenson, being a trainee in the museum, working for the Royal Collection. Art history in this moment really benefited not only from having, from not, from, sorry, art history benefited from not having an established academic tradition even uh, until the, the late 1930s. And having contacts with emigrants, German scholars and their interests and being receptive for Italian and German scholarship on the Seicento Mahone's and Clarke's showed that the absence, perhaps, of a clear direction or a clear approach in the end enriched the, um, the path that many scholars took, but it also um, fitted in in the opposite direction towards also the study, the study of the British art, for instance. And here we see how the path from Roberto Lunghi's studies in, ne in Nicholson then led also to looking at the art of Joseph White to Derby. And I'll just leave it here. <laughs> uh, Sarah, for introducing um, three key figures there. And I hope I managed to We've got a, a, a few um, minutes for, for questions or comments now, which can come, oh, well, 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 I meant to come online, or can come from the room. Um, just as we'll kick, kick things off, I mean, we've seen from both of you figures who are collectors as well as writers, art writers, art historians, and that's another question about what do we call them. <laughs> um, um, is there ever kind of a, a sense or an acknowledgement that being a collector as well as a writer on art is in any way a problem? Is it compromising? Is there a kind of conflict of interest? Or is it always kind of generative and positive? And do please use the microphones. I think it should be on. You think you've turned it off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did I? 
That's a fascinating question because it, of course, is exactly this question of a disinterested scholarship that we would normally see as the hallmark of a good academic. But um, uh, I didn't necessarily get the sense. I mean, I was really in, in, in <laughs> struck by the Terbergen who's on the cover of the very publication, uh, where this is not just a, a, a tacit inclusion of a work that you own, but actually quite a bullish uh, showcasing of it. Um, I think the striking thing where Oppe, I think, Sarah fits in your list really beautifully as well, is that for Collecting clearly came before writing about these objects, right? It's, it's not an academic expertise that then leads them to the find, to buy an impressive and undervalued work. So they're not the disinterested academic in the first place, but they start out with collecting. Ope starts around 1905 to buy British works on paper, but then only writes the first articles quite a few years thereafter. Mm -hmm. And I think that seemed to come through in years as well, that it, it goes this way around. Uh, so that so that the activity as as collector seems so quite quite formative for, for finding a certain area of expertise. And at this very moment, I think it's not seen mm. as an issue, mm. right? Not something where you exploit skill. And again, that's the question of professionalization. When you when you read through these debates, should I acknowledge whether I'm publishing one of my own works today? Mm. Um, that assumes that you have an unfair advantage and perhaps financially vested interest where you are exploiting your maybe publicly sponsored uh, 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 scholarship, right? Mm. I'm, an, I'm a state employed academic, so I have knowledge that I, that, that, uh, that's built on the taxpayer, but I might enrich myself. That doesn't happen in the moment where you don't have a job, essentially, mm. that is paid by anybody else, mm. where that, that, that disinterestedness as a concept, I think, is quite out of the window. Sarah, would you like to say? Yeah, I just, um, whilst reading through that letter that uh, Mahon wrote to Barrison, he says explicitly, I do not like to state in my publications that the pictures that, my, that I may reproduce are owned by me, because I don't want the readers to be distracted by these questions of conflicts of interest and so on, and one should just purely see them as illustrations of whatever he was writing and explaining. Mm. And that really has been the, the dilemma of my whole research, and still is, because that's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, and the more I delve into it, the more I just see that really collecting is a way of fostering, opening up a way of inquiry, and it is accompanying and stimulating ideas. Um, as it probably was even mm. before. Then it, the, I think the difference is when the collector also actively involves into trying to be a professional art historian or mm. a museum creator or whatsoever. Um, at the front, do wait for the microphones if you're asking, it's Kim. It's on, yes. Yeah. Um, I, just a further comment to that, uh, especially about the idea of being a collector leading you into the idea of becoming an art historian. I think most of the people you mentioned, except Ope, most of them didn't really need a job. They were looking for um, they were looking for a work in the museum so that they could get hands on and, and work. It's what their passion was, and they thought that was where they could where it could take them. But also, it's important to remember that curators at this time too was not a very it was a very not very well paid. The people that were curators in museums and galleries were very well off and they didn't need the museum salary. They were there more because they wanted to be there. And if you think of the ones who worked in, in British art, um, who were in museums, uh, most of them were quite, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, so there's, there's Campbell at the British Museum, there's Lawrence Binion, there's um, a whole series, uh, Croft Murray. None of them needed this, the, the museum salary. They, they were there because they wanted to work on well, on British art in those instances. Um, so I think that's really important to keep in mind. And that, and it's this whole idea of dilettantism. It, there, it wasn't seen as something that was, um, uh, that was negative at the time. They could be proud to be sort of dilettantes in, in British art history. Also, the other thing is to remember the role of British art in the whole way that we looked at art history. It was very much bottom rung of the, of the ladder. And, Renaissance and old masters were far more important just as they are, they are now. 
So if there's a, there's a fun line in the Roy Strong diaries where he actually claims for a taxi fare and that is seen as outrageous by his colleagues in the V&A because why would you do something like that? You should have independent means, of course. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Um, I just wanted to add that sometimes it's useful also to compare the British situation with some other scenarios. So for instance, in the Italian um, new school of art history, there were also bursary offered for um, students who wanted to become or join the um, art historical estate. And this also often allowed many women to join um, the, the court. Uh, but then at the same time, there were many not very rich art historians who still collected and maybe went for drawings or actually in this case, even um, genre or areas that were not very looked after. So in fact, um, Mahone's and Nicholson's purchases were not very pricey at all. Um, and on the other side, you may have someone like Roberto Longhi or Bernard Berenson who were making money through the art world and could afford them to to buy what they wanted. And this, again, usually tends to reflect their own interests. And again, they weren't very expensive paintings, not all the time, at least. We're going to try and squeeze in two more in, uh, in order. Um, There's just a comment on oh, just saying it's hard to more. hear from the audience when you speak. So we'll just is, that, is that, am I? Am it's, I work, it's working, okay, isn't it? Great. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, that was a great start to the conference. Uh, this is a question for Hans. Um, I was struck by how Nietzschean you made Ope sound, uh, not just for his um, classical training, uh, but also for his hatred of historicism. And this might be, oh, this might be like a mean or unfair question to start things off with, but uh, what do you think Paul Ope would have made of the historiography of art history? <laughs> Oh, that's, 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 that's an excellent question. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what to make of it. He seemed to have a certain aversion against honours as well. So he, he declined an uh, uh, MBE, I think, something like that. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether he was into uh, being entirely uh, maybe historicized. I do like the Nietzsche reference. Um, I don't, I'm not aware, at least, of him having read Nietzsche, but I think it's important. You know, again, it's, we often quote Nietzsche for this kind of idea of art as this, 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 um, uh, um, this, this, this release, this, 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 uh, this, this medium to, to allow us to, to, to gain our true and higher self. But I think, again, the idea is perhaps slightly slightly further spread than, than we, we often acknowledge. And I, I'm struck, yes, you're right, he's a classicist. But as a classicist, he's quite a, quite a positivist guy. You know, he writes this article about Delphi, and it's not about the great myths of Delphi. It's about how exactly the geology in that side works. You know, it's, it's very uh, sober, actually. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely right. I think that's where uh, uh, Nietzsche, of course, also is somebody who's an anti-academic, anti essentially, even though he was a professor for a while. And I think this anti-academicism um, is, is often relegated too much to these extraordinary figures such as Nietzsche, uh, instead of actually being seen as perhaps a slightly wider social phenomenon. Okay, we are running behind, but we can uh, take one more. Uh, well, I haven't, I haven't really got time. It's fascinating stuff, but um, in this talk of dilettantism, I was, I was just reminded by the illustration you put in of, in the little booklet we've just seen of the book on Botticelli by Ope, and I, I wondered about how much money he would have made. It was not, not enough to talk about this bourgeois, more bourgeois lady art historians in England compared to the slightly more professional thing. But I just thought that the person left out of the discussion is Herbert Horn's Botticelli, which is two years earlier than Ope's, who really couldn't be accused in any way of being a dilettante. So. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. And I think this fits in exactly with what I tried to say about the, the attempt to make a living as an art historian as well. I think Bot, uh, Arpe here was a try to break into markets that are perhaps not the strictly historical ones, something that Horn, for example, would have covered to an extent. Uh, and, and I think that essentially is also why he remained unsuccessful, because he tried to 
place himself between the different trends. You know, not not the not the Botticellian beauty, this apologist of something surreal and super su super super mention if you want to be Nietzschean about it, uh, but also not the serious his historian that that Horn might have represented. Um, it it's much trace. Who was praised already at the time by Warburg, of course, who was a he great was, admirer yes. of Horn. There were quite a few Botticelli publications in exactly that time, so in that sense I also find it a surprising choice, uh, to be honest, especially if you want to make money with a book and you go into a rather crowded market. Um, so I'm not sure whether he entirely made the right commercial decisions as well, dear Oppe. Okay. I think with that we will move on to the next session, have a change of chair, um, and I'll be passing over to my colleague Charlotte, but uh, do please thank again Hans and Sarah. Good afternoon everyone. Um, as Martin's already said, I'm the Centre's archivist, and I was responsible with my colleague Emma for bringing the archive and library to the Centre, so it gives me particular pleasure to chair the next session, since both of the speakers... Um, are giving papers that are based on research conducted using the OPE archive and library. Um, and indeed, their work fed into the drawing room display downstairs, which I know that most of you, unfortunately, wouldn't have been able to see on your way in, but there will be opportunities later. And in fact, um, for those of you that are coming back tomorrow, there'll be chances to, to revisit the conversation that we're going to have in the next session, because Hans will be giving um, his very own tour of the display cabinets and... Uh, Helen's is, uh, talk is very much based on one of the display cabinets and Martin's on the other one. So if you miss things today, there's an opportunity to hear them again tomorrow. Um, without further ado, because I know we're running late, I will introduce the first speaker. So the first spe speaker is Dr. Helen Glaister. She is an art, art historian specialising in Chinese ceramics and decorative arts. She's particularly focused on the intersection between Chinese and European art, design and aesthetics during the modern period. She began her museum career at the British Museum and worked as programme director of the World Arts and Artifacts programme at Birkbeck before progressing to her current position as course director of the Arts of Asia programme at the VNA. Helen was awarded her PhD from SOAS, where she regularly teaches. She published her first monograph, Chinese Art Objects, Collect Collecting and Interior Design in the 20th Century in 2022. And she's contributed to various exhibitions and cataloguing projects on Chinese art, most recently, the Liverpool Museum's touring exhibition to China in 2023. So who better then to talk about Ope and Chinese art? Um, Helen's paper is very simply titled, Very Largely Chinese, but Not Entirely, Paul Ope on Chinese Art. Helen, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. And it was a real pleasure to work on the display and to present to you today on this topic. From November 1935 until March 1936, Paul Ope dedicated his personal diary, Black Book 10, to the subject of Chinese art. The book begins on the 29th of November, one day after the opening of the groundbreaking International Exhibition of Chinese Art at Burlington House, which made an immediate and lasting impression on the art historian who made multiple visits. Towards the end of the show, Ope published his detailed response to the painting Myriad Miles of the Yangtze River by the Song Dynasty master Xia Gui in the Times, praising it as one of the most effective and imaginative landscapes in the world. In his letter to the editor, Ope highlights the importance of, of observing the painting in situ, being the first opportunity to see such exemplary artworks outside China. Ope goes on to assess the quality of the brush strokes and stylistic differences across the over 11 meter long scroll, concurring with other scholars that the work is the product of at least two hands. Disagreements between English and, in and Chinese critics on this point is also alluded to, indicating a degree of direct engagement between these academic circles and Ope's familiarity with developments in the field. This was not Ope's first encounter with Chinese art and culture. Letters in his archive reveal aspects of his short visit to China and colonial Hong Kong as part of an extended family trip to New Zealand in 1893-4, incorporating present-day Sri Lanka, Japan and Singapore. In Canton, 
the 15-year-old Ope records his arrival to the narrow streets of the commercial district. From a street of wood carvers, he was carried by a sedan chair to a street where ornaments of silver were inlaid with kingfisher feathers, then on to rice painters' shops, that is Chinese export paintings, where one man takes the head, the other the body. Ope remarks upon various aspects of the traditional Chinese secular and religious architecture, visiting the Viceroy's summer house and comparing Buddhist temples to those he had already seen in Japan, including a nine-story pagoda with 500 images and the Chinese Tartar city where few foreigners ventured. Ope's younger brother, Henry, was later stationed in Shanghai and correspondence between the two offer insights into the availability and acquisition of Chinese art objects in the years immediately following the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1912. At the time, Ope was employed as deputy director of the South Kensington Museum. And on the December the 18th, 1912, Henry expressed his wish to present two Chinese paintings, portraits of once living persons, that is ancestor portraits, similar to these, but not the, those you're looking at on the screen, to the museum. He had purchased the paintings for three pounds and explains that they probably originated from some Peking house and had been sold owing to the, to the revolution. The paintings never entered the London Museum, and while the final destination of these paintings remains unknown, the purchase and transfer of art objects from Chinese private hands to international collectors, museums, and art dealers typifies the outpouring of Chinese art objects onto the global art market in the first decades of the 20th century. Back in Britain, the increasing availability of arts from early China was seized upon by collectors and art critics such as Roger Fry, who promoted Chinese art and aesthetics alongside modernism through the Burlington magazine. As Ralph Parfect, Judith Green and Craig Clunas have shown, Fry was among a number of influential art critics whose specialism lay in Western art, who turned to Chinese art to revitalize contemporary art practice. The 1915 exhibition of Chinese art at the Burlington Fine Arts Club was the first of its kind, and the selection committee included leading collectors, George Eumorphopoulos and Oscar Raphael, alongside museum experts Lawrence Binion from the British Museum and Sir Oscar Raphael from the South Kensington Museum, who are also listed as contributors. As a BFAC member, Ope visited the exhibition and his response to individual works of art can be observed in his annotated catalogue, which is downstairs, where he grades some of the objects as good, bad, passable, or clumsy. He makes interesting, although inaccurate, comparisons be between Chinese art objects and Egyptian, Greek, and Byzantine art, reflecting a wider tendency amongst Western art critics to universalize art appreciation seeking connections between Western art traditions and those of Asia, where none exist. As interest in Chinese art gathered pace, collectors in Britain gravitated towards ceramics, and in 1921, the first specialist society dedicated to Asian ceramics was formed. Initially constituting a small and select group of 12 gentlemen who met in the comfort of their homes, the Oriental Ceramic Society soon expanded in size and scope publishing academic papers regularly through transactions. By 1933, there were 120 members and meetings were held at the Court Order Institute of Art in Portman Square. The OCS Council, led by Sir Percival David and including Eumorphopoulos and Raphael mentioned above, along with Robert Hobson of the British Museum, were instrumental in initiating and orchestrating the pivotal international exhibition of Chinese art which took place at the Royal Academy from November 1935 until March 1936. With the support of the British and Chinese government, numerous, numerous rare and exceptional Chinese national tre treasures were shipped to London where they were exhibited for the first time, alongside art artworks from leading Japanese, European and American museums, dealers and private collectors, including many OCS members. As Percival David stated, quote, the scope of the exhibition is wider and more ambitious than any of its brilliant predecessors. 
an endeavour has been made to bring together, as far as possible, the finest and most representative examples of, of the arts and crafts of China from the dawn of its history to the year 1800. The exhibition included over 3,000 examples of Chinese paintings, sculpture and applied arts, of which over 800 were loaned by the Chinese government. A small volume was published to coincide with the exhibition, and in his chapter on painting, Lawrence Binion stressed the importance of approaching and understanding Chinese painting from a Chinese perspective. He stated, if we are truly to appreciate any work of art, it is idle to appreciate it from the outside, bringing with us all our prejudices and preconceptions. We must try to enter into the mind of the man who made it, discover what his aim was and consider how far he has achieved his aim. In the case of Chinese painting, while it is easy to enjoy the decorative qualities presented by its surface, we cannot understand it without some knowledge of the Chinese conception of picture making, of the painter's approach to his subject and the mental background behind his art. With this in mind, a series of lectures took place in parallel with the event, some addressing a specialist topic while others were tailored to a more general audience. Speakers at the, at the Royal Academy included leading British academics, curators and collectors. Sir Percival Yetz, the first professor of Chinese art and archaeology at the School of Oriental Studies, which was founded in 1930. Uh, museum experts Bernard Rackham, Robert Hobson and Lee Ashton, as well as archaeologists and sinologists from France, Sweden, America and Japan. Only one Chinese speaker was included, the ambassador of the Republic of China to the United Kingdom, Dr. F.T. Chung, who introduced some cultural and historical aspects of Chinese art. Lectures also took place at the University of London and Morley College, as well as those given by Chinese artist Chang Yi at SOAS. The importance of this exhibition cannot be overstated, both to the field of Chinese art in Britain and the impact it had on visitors such as Ope. His immediate response to individual objects can be seen in his annotated catalogue, where he notes the perfection of shape of Exhibit 196, an ancient bronze wine vessel. Ope situates unfamiliar Chinese objects within established Western classifications, as was customary at the time, identifying the decorative bands of Exhibit 166 as proto-Corinthian Greek style. A more detailed and in-depth discussion of all aspects of Chinese art and aesthetics is offered in his personal diary, Black Book 10. Captioned, very largely Chinese, but not entirely. His initial thoughts were further refined in his review of the exhibition, and he records that, quote, I welcome this opportunity to write about Chinese art, primarily because it seemed wasteful to allow the many thoughts, somewhat fresh and different, which have come to me in the weeks of the exhibition, to pass away like so many other things without precise utterance and permanent memorial. And of course, it seemed desirable to associate them definitively with my name for what they may be worth. Ope's wide-ranging commentaries cover the duration of the exhibition and frequently juxtapose Chinese art and its Western counterpart, reality with fantasy, the human form, writing and calligraphy, decoration and ornament, and so forth. His discussion of rhythmic vitality, or Shangdong in Chinese, a principle associated with 5th century Chinese artist and scholar Xie He, and much cited in modernist Sinophile discourse, demonstrates his awareness of Chinese art historical frameworks as understood at the time. Ope observes interesting correlations between the work of watercolorist Alexander Cousins and Chinese landscape painting. He writes, Cousins attempts to analyze landscape, clouds, trees, human features into classes and groups, as satirized by Kay Clark, is another indication of his similarity with the Chinese, even chinoiserie. It is conceivable that ever curious and not English, he learned something from the mysterious Chinese artist who he sometimes included among the early Royal Academicians. And he's seen on the left of the painting at the top. Ope is here referring to Tan Chi Chua, known as Chi Chua, a Chinese artist who modeled portraits in clay and was lionized on his arrival in London in 1769. 
several of his clay figures were exhibited at the Royal Academy, and he was painted by uh, John Hamilton Mortimer, drawn by Charles Grignon, and even included in Zoffany's remarkable depiction of the Academy painted for George III. China and the Chinese landscape was certainly in the minds of cousins and his peers. Writing to his friend on the perceived similarities between the landscape of the Netherlands and China, William Beckwith observed, quote, the minute neatness of the villages, their red roofs, and the lively green of the willows correspond with the ideas I had formed of Chinese prospects. He goes on, I was perfectly in the environ of Canton or Ningbo till we reached Meerdijk. At the time of the Burlington House exhibition, Ope discussed his theories with Chinese artist Chang Yi, who was by then living in London. Chang arrived in 1933 and was one of a growing number of Chinese artists and intellectuals based here during the interwar years. He lived in Hampstead with fellow expatriate, the writer and playwright Shi Yi Xiong, who became the first Chinese person to direct a West End play, Lady Precious Stream, seen here at the bottom. Chang was soon well acquainted with British writers and curators who were keen to contextualise and internationalise British art. They turned to him for advice on Chinese painting and calligraphy, and Ope acknowledges his help in translating inscriptions on the aforementioned painting Myriad Miles. Sir Herbert Reed noted, he, was great, he has greatly extended our knowledge not only of Chinese civilization, but of art and civilization in general. Chang received many distinguished Chinese guests, including artists Xu Bei Hong and Liu Hai Su, and in 1935, the same year as the exhibition at the Royal Academy, worked with Liu to mount an exhibition of modern Chinese painting at the New Burlington Galleries. His encounters with Roger Fry, Lawrence Binion, and Herbert Reed are all discussed in his 1938 book, The Silent Traveller in London, where he recalls dining with Ope at his home. On the invitation of Ope, Chang was shown his collection of English watercolours, including a tiger, seen here, sketchily painted in the 1770s by Alexander Cousins in monochrome India ink. The Chinese painter notes, the more familiar I become with English watercolours, the more points of similarity I find between them and our paintings. The treatment in the black and white wash drawings of Cotman, Cousins, Constable and Cameron make me believe there is really no boundary between English and Chinese art at all. The Burlington House exhibition acted as a catalyst for the production of books on Chinese art for the general and specialist reader. In 1935 alone, five books on Chinese art were published, including The Chinese Eye by Chang Yi, the only Chinese author. This book fulfilled a vital role in demystifying principles of Chinese art as a practice and a subject for study. It offered readers an introduction to the fundamental principles of Chinese painting and a clearly defined cultural context within which to appreciate it. The book was not intended to be an academic study of Chinese painting, but offered a more accessible approach, based on the personal experience and perspective of a practicing Chinese artist. The book was met with critical acclaim from the general public as well as the academic community. Art, art critic Herbert Reed wrote of it, he has explained the Chinese conception of art so clearly and thus enabled us to appreciate its qualities with a true aesthetic understanding. Lawrence Binion also reviewed his book, writing, this book tells much in small compass, and to all who take an interest in Chinese painting and want to know more about its essential qualities, it will be an initiation. The Chinese eye identified Chang as a respected authority on Chinese painting and marked the beginning of his prolific publishing career. The following year, Oswald Siren's important work, The Chinese on the Art of Painting, provided the first book in English which drew extensively on Chinese sources, offering a firm foundation for academic study. Ope's short but meaningful annotations in his book indicates his direct engagement with Chinese art theory. 
The OPE archive is rich in material which connects the specialist in British art with developments in the history and historiography of Chinese art in Britain up to 1936. After that point, little substantial evidence suggests a direct engagement with the subject. And it could be argued that as the field of Chinese art history developed as a distinct and separate entity, it became increasingly remote from the arena of Euro-American art practice and theory. A comment made later in 1952 indicates the lasting impression Chinese art had made on Ope. Again, on the work of Cousins, he stated, in the true blot, of blot, the energy of the controlled brushwork and the shaping of the black and white spaces immediately satisfy the sophisticated eye of today, both with their decorative and their suggestive power. Though never patterns in the ordinary sense, they have that compelling unity of spirit of the well-informed ideograph, which in Chinese eyes is equivalent to a picture. If they are considered as representational, the force of the impact and the emphasis of interest, again, as in Chinese painting, more than compensate for the absence of perspective and atmospheric tonality. So to conclude, while not usually associated with Chinese art and aesthetics, the personal papers, exhibition catalogues, books and other documents held in the OPE archive shine a light on this aspect of his work. From his personal engagement, a wider picture emerges, highlighting the intersection of Chinese and British art, in particular the traditions of landscape painting, watercolours and ink painting, from the 18th century down to his own time. Ope was one of a number of art specialists schooled in the Western tradition who turned their attention to Chinese art objects and aesthetics in the first decades of the 20th century. Roger Fry and Herbert Reed can also be understood in these terms, as well as museum experts, Lawrence Binion and Bernard Rackham. A similar shift can also be detected in the collections of George Eumorphopoulos. The pivot towards China was due in large part to political change and social upheaval which facilitated the movement of art objects and artists from China to the West, raising public awareness of Chinese art in Britain through public exhibitions and publications and revealing the full extent of Chinese art objects of all kinds as never before. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was really fascinating. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but um, if people can hold them um, in their heads until um, the next speaker has finished. Martin, this is like revolving doors. So you're, you're up again, and I know that he, Martin has already said Martin is head of grants and fellowships and networks at the centre. Um, and in these positions, I know he plays a pivotal role in bringing together and facilitating conversations between hundreds of specialists in the field. So I'm sure that he's already well known to many of you. Before joining the centre in 2020, Martin spent over 20 years in curatorial roles at Tate, latterly a senior curator of pre-19th century British art. His exhibitions at Tate Britain have included Gothic Nightmares in 2006, British Folk Art in 2014, and Hogarth and Europe in 2021. Martin was awarded his PhD from the Courthold Institute, where he is also taught. His research and publications have focused on 18th and 19th century British art, with a special interest in artistic identity and artist labour, class, cultural opportunity and gender. He has published widely his most recent book, Making the Modern Artist, Culture, Class and Art Educational Opportunity in Romantic Britain, was published by the Paul Mellon Centre in 2020. Martin's paper is focused on Ope's encounter with a, a young art historian, David Loshak. His paper is titled simply Ope and David Loshak. Martin, over to you. So, um, Oppie versus Loshak, the new art history of circa 1955. I'm concerned here with a brisk exchange of letters between Oppie and a younger art historian, David Loshak. At stake here are four sheets of paper, two AML letters from Loshak in New York to Oppie in Chelsea, London, two typed responses posted back to Loshak by Oppie. These running from 25th of July 1955 to 17th of August 1955. So, you know, less than a month. The sequence of letters is quite readily described, and I will do so in a moment. 
Beyond this, there's a slightly more extended time frame, which would take us from 1948, when Alpe met Loshak, and it appears recommended him as the co-author of a new book by Tom Gerton, uh, on Thomas Gerton to be written by a descendant and namesake Tom Gerton, through to February 1957, when the Burlington Magazine published a long response by Loshak to Oppie's scathing review of the resulting book, uh, published in that journal in December 1955, together with um, Oppie's shorter response to Loshak's commentary. Oppie died later in 1957, and in a sense, the matter ends there, although there is a third frame I want to address, one that extends across the whole of the biological lives of, the, of our two protagonists and, indeed, beyond, into family histories and outwards and onwards into the world at large and through to the present day. So, firstly, to dispense with that short chronology. On the 25th of July, 1955, Loshak writes to Oppe setting out that he intended to apply for a Guggenheim Foundation grant to enable him to travel to Europe to continue his studies on Watts, he had, been pre he had previously been released from teaching duties at Michigan State College to undertake a PhD at the Courtauld in 1950 to 52. As the co-author of a substantial academic monograph and as the guest curator of the Watts exhibition organized by the Arts Council at the Tate Gallery in 1954 to five, Loshak might reasonably have expected support. He was to be um, disappointed. On the 7th of August, Oppie wrote back, declining to provide a reference and in quite emphatic terms. He had already written his damning review and shared the proofs with Tom Gerton, but not with Loshak. So the strength of Oppie's opinions came as a shock to the younger man. He was alarmed, particularly by Oppie's claim that he, the younger man, was motivated by some sort of base commercial instinct that he should be kind of uh, writing for money rather than for scholarship. Making a remarkably uh, frank statement about the material conditions of his intellectual production, Loshak set out in reply that it was only by virtue of the GI Bill that he had been able to undertake his research. Um, in the final exchange, and these letters are upstairs and in the book, and some of them in the booklet as well. Um, Ope slouched towards an apology, but didn't quite make it there. Now, um, Ope, in 1955, was an old man he was in his late 70s, and Loshak was youngish, 36. We might hurry past this exchange as nothing more than a bout of elderly grumpiness and intergenerational conflict, perhaps. But I want to make the case that there is much more at stake here seeing this as a clash of worldviews. Worldviews informed by class and status, economic and social position, nationality and understandings of ethnicity. A clash that exposes the powerfully compounded elements of xenophobia, anti-intellectualism, racial and class prejudice that sit behind the out outwardly benign and genial facade of the world of British art history. To think about that question, um, I want to mobilize some thoughts about the embodied nature of knowledge developed in the field of contemporary anti-racism, uh, much of which has been the labor of women and of women of color. But also, as I'm still an old white guy, I want to restate the generative potential of critical theory in its early iterations. And in doing this, I'm going to uh, also kind of make a case for um, a crudely, even crassly materialist dimension for what, um, uh, uh, in thinking about intellectual production, even down to, I mean, this is about bodies and spaces and places and rooms. In regard to this question, Oppie's status not only as a clerk of art history, as Hans would um, uh, suggest, uh, uh, but an actual civil servant is instrumental. What Hans views, um, I think a little detachedly as a metaphor, is rather less and rather more than a means of grasping the inner scholarly dynamic of a defined field of intellectual inquiry. It is instead a position within the intellectual field, which is also a position in the wider social field with the kinds of exclusion and inclusion and even violence or symbolic violence that implies. Um, and as you kind of go through, I've gone through the 
you know, the biographical uh, you know, official records of, um, of his life. And he's always identified as a civil servant. I mean, I, th I think it's right. The first real kind of reference is um, when he's uh, given an award by the British Academy, he's called an art historian. Everything else is always a civil servant, including in, in the kind of um, official census records. Ope, in 1955, was a now long-retired civil servant. Um, he'd stepped down in 19, by 1938 um, when his annual salary was published, the salaries would have been between 1,450 and 1,650 which means um, to judge from this table published in the 1955 study of the civil service, he earned more than a professor at Edinburgh, interestingly, <laughs> um, but less than the headmaster of the City of London School. There was, of course, many in the, in the family already to an extent. Um, both his mother and father's families were textile traders. His father, a silk merchant, um, naturalized in 1886 with his children, including Paul, um, um, dying that year. Um, after Oxford, and we've heard a little of this already, and St. Andrews and a stab at teaching classics, he took on an appointment at the Board of Education. We've seen this already, this letter of appointment. That division of the civil service had, interestingly, held out against the reforms of the late 19th century that were introduced a note, however modest, of meritocracy through examinations and, interview and interviews for higher civil servants. The board, of, the, sorry, the board of Education continued to appoint individually without exams, coming into close scrutiny for this knowingly exclusive practice in the 1912-13 Royal Commission and only conceding to a modicum of equity in its recruitment procedures under duress in 1919, so long after um, he was appointed. Um, Oppie's appointment was then from a kind of an older world of civil service patronage. As Hans has observed, Oppie was never a professional art historian. His stints at the V&A were secondments. Having a full-time job in the higher echelons of the Board of Education did not, however, prevent him from pursuing his intellectual and collecting interests. And Hans has already quoted today that wonderful um, comment about, uh, from a friend that um, this role would give him plenty of time and excellent stationery. Um, and a little more seriously, I'd uh, point to uh, Gail Savage's 1982 analysis of the Board of Education in the interwar years and, and the uh, uh, educational social backgrounds and of its uh, higher um, servants and their ineffectiveness and uh, indeed uh, occasional obstructiveness in terms of educational reform. I'll come back to this. This surely provides a context for the tangible sense of distaste Oppie expresses toward Low Shack, who had, daringly perhaps, to make a living and, it's, uh, and make a living as an academic. And it seems worse still, he was actually academically qualified not as an art historian, having studied in America, of all places. Now, um, there was a kind of ontological complicity between these two men. Uh, they are both men from well-off middle-class backgrounds, or relatively well-off middle-class backgrounds, and Loshak goes to great efforts that flatter the older man and speak his language. It's not, we're not kind of, it's a clash, but they're trying to speak the same language. Loshak is trying to speak the same language. But this very proximity perhaps only sharpened, to quote the contemporary sociologist Beverly Skeggs, more awareness how, of how wrong your practices, appearance, and knowledge actually are. Um, I can't go into this here, but I think there is an illuminating contrast with the very convivial letters to Ope from another young American art historian, Ray Murphy, from a couple of years earlier, um, littered with anti-Jewish sentiments and snide allusions to the world of paid work. But Murphy was a different kind of American. Ope received his copy of the Girton book from Tom Girton in November 1954 and set about reading it and annotating it heavily. Um, now, I've been, this is the copy of, um, um, in the, uh, the, the library here, which um, I've transcribed the 450 annotations and generated a little word cloud to see what um, was most common in terms of um, Ope's <laughs> comments. I think uh, the infographic will do the work there, I think. The published review, <clears throat> as published in the Burlington magazine, makes some gentle criticism of, of Tom Gertin, the co-author, but absolutely damns Loshak, mainly for his apparently provocative language and thinking, and distortions emanating, it seems, 
from his, um, uh, from his contributions of provenance in an MA thesis undertaken in the US. And this is a point which is made in the correspondence and, and in, the, in the published review that somehow he's, he's a long way, he, he was producing work to um, impress his uh, uh, supervisors rather than to um, uh, reach towards the truth. Worse still, that American provenance of Loshak's intellectual formation made itself apparent in his writing, in his use of terms, in the very style of his writing. Um, and the final words, uh, this is the draft where he, Ope, uh, dismisses the, the, uh, the book as uh, an, an immature uh, production. Um, in, the, in the end, it's ill-considered. I think Nicholson must have sort of persuaded him to tone it down a little bit. Um, now, this kind of question of language use and its meaning was kind of even more emphatic and in a kind of illuminating way in a review in the uh, TLS by um, I.A. Williams, uh, where you can see uh, the Americanisms um, that Loshak apparently employed are down. He has a propensity to, to use words like individuation and empath empathic, which are presumably better liked across the Atlantic than here. Now, 1955 is, of course, a moment of strong anti-American feeling, stretching from the work of, that Richard Hoggart was doing, which became the uses of literacy, through to the moral panic around American horror comics, which played out in the latter part of 1954 and into 1955, so this precise moment, resulting in uh, legislation in December 1955. And Ope's words on Loshak follow a track also established in these discussions. So the idea that language is being deployed for sensationist effect in order to have profit or have an impact rather than with clarity and purpose. The published review focused on failures of detail, which in Oppie's eyes, reflected a lack of engagement with the material object, most materially the account of Bridge North, the drawing of Bridge North, with Loshak and Gerting claimed was on two sheets of paper and was the result of different moments of work. Um, Oppe, who could, uh, had only to pop over to the study room at the British Museum to check, insisted it was on a single sheet. From this point, Oppe develops the claim that Loshak's argument as a whole can be disregarded as Loshak, as Loshak um, noted in his response. Uh, yeah, so saying um, yeah, that, that uh, 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 Oppie feels he can sort of dismiss the, general, the, the, the commentaries on the, on the general causes of the artist on the basis of this, this um, uh, apparent error. Um, here's the drawing. I'm going to come back to it later on. Oh, right at the end, rather. Now, this line of argument strikes me as kind of interestingly reminiscent or kind of resonant with uh, what um, Adorno observed in his essay, Guilt and Defense, published in 1955, lots of stuff happens in 1955, published in 1955 as part of the Frankfurt School's group experiment. Now this is a knotty quote, uh, but the point is that there is truth and untruth. This is not a kind of relativistic or kind of post-structuralist argument about truth. Uh, there is truth and untruth, but truth is mobilized in a context, and it may be mobilized um, as a form of ideology. Themes that in themselves are justified appear in contexts in which their truth content functions solely to distract from the offense committed. Um, so arguably, you know, this reference to truth, uh, the truth of that bridge north drawing, sort of offsets or, or, or works alongside, well, I can't give you a reference, you know, because. Oppe's comments suggest that he viewed Loshak as uh, unable to grasp truth, as damaged, perverted, and in terms that were some fault of his national character. He hoped, and this is a kind of very odd sentence, he hoped Tom Gurton's English common sense would benefit the younger scholar, a comment which um, contradicts uh, his own claim that Girton was misguided and phantasmic because of his relationship with the artist. Loshak uh, was American, but by adoption, and only rather recently. He was born in 1919 in Pinna, his parents both Russian Jews, his father a fur merchant who had escaped political 
persecution. And this is a little family reminiscence, which I, I think is kind of extraordinary in suggesting the kind of intellectual heritage, which is uh, bookish, uh, critical, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of knowingly intellectual and kind of multilinguistic and, uh, and, and, yeah, and sort of politically purposeful. Um, the family, uh, or, or uh, his father, Mayor Loshak, um, together with the family, had uh, naturalized in 1911 and indeed had made a great success. Um, there's the parents, Fanny and Mayor, who'd married in Whitechapel in 1907. Um, there's the uh, uh, certificate of naturalization, giving his uh, uh, Mayor Loshak's origins in Gritsev in Ukraine. Um, and the barest statement of the family's movement from Gritsev to Whitechapel, to Stoke Newington, to Pinner, sort of tracks an immigrant success story of the early 20th century. And actually, the success goes um, some way beyond that. In 1937, Mayor Loshak's firm, which was transatlantic, had an office in New York as well, supplied the ermines for uh, the coronation. And Mayor Loshak was able to amass uh, sub sub substantial wealth, enough to um, fund an academic prize at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, and the prize itself is sort of suggests sign of sympathies at that point. The family business had a New York as well as a London base, and David Loshak went out with his uncle, apparently on business in 1938. In the years that followed, published some art criticism, worked as the secretary of the Clay Club, a kind of artist-led space, served in the US Army, um, and as he noted, by virtue of his GI Bill, got an MA and started working on Watts. Within the family, and I've had the pleasure of being able to talk uh, with Loshak's daughter, who may actually be online, I hope, hope, hope she is. The story was that his highest ambition as an art historian was thwarted by the falling out with a mentor, which meant that he could never complete his PhD and become established, um, which must be this falling out with Ope. There was to be no Guggenheim Fellowship, nor much further work on Watts. Loshak uh, took up teaching posts at a range of US universities and in Sweden, and in later life moved to Denmark. There he wrote on Munch and Watts and contributed to the Turner Show at the Staten's Museum in 1976. His last, most obviously political work, um, a pamphlet on art in the age of manipulation, sets out to expose the rise of post-war abstraction as a symptom of museum's instrumentalization by wealthy capitalists that was self-published in 1982. But he was never a major player in the world of British art. He died in 1996. Loshak's nephew and namesake, David Loshak, later a distinguished journalist and writer, also went to America in his youth, sent there by his parents as, uh, during, the, during um, the war. His daughter recorded a memoir published in his college magazine after his death in 2021, that on returning he found it hard to integrate with the boys at his grammar school not just for his strange last name, long trousers, ballroom dancing, and access to a car, but as the son of a Jewish com communist vegetarian. <laughs> the older David Loshak certainly has the funny name. Um, we do not need to be euphemistic. Uh, it's a kind of name that signifies a foreign Jewish identity. Um, and that surely has a role to play here as well. I mean, I don't know what tr his trousers were like in 1955, and he apparently had a red moped rather than a car, but there's a kind of, there's an analogy to be drawn. Given the repeated insistent anti-Semitic comments that appear in Oppie's private notebooks, and indeed in the correspondence with Murphy, we have to acknowledge the, uh, the potential of an element of prejudice being aired here. That Oppie had a, a, a Jewish heritage uh, is material too. Here he is being um, naturalized as part of the family at the age of seven. But the Oppenheimers, who were his ancestors, had become Oppes with a Frenchifying accent in the 19th century. And that Jewish heritage is generally ignored in modern biographical accounts. It's not in the um, Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, for instance, although Oppie does appear in reference works on Jewish biography, and the center is uh, set this out quite carefully. Uh, more pointedly, when in his obituary notice, Kenneth Clark, Lord Clark noted, that, uh, noted Oppe's stooped appearance and his supposed resemblance to Disraeli, he was not, one suspects, randomly choosing a historical figure. Still, however, there is a contrast here between Loshak, whose father was Russian, and, was, uh, who, and who was, um, have I got that slide now, I haven't, um, and who was personally identified as Hebrew when he, when he applied for US citizenship in 1939, whose family business was the fur trade, 
and the cosmopolitan Opes and Jaffes with their French accented names, their lives in Germany and France, Ireland and England. There is even an almost excessive semiotic eloquence in the contrast between the French presenting silk merchants and the Eastern, even orientalized fur merchants, West versus East, Europe versus the Orient, silk versus fur, Opi versus Loshak. There is arguably a kind of ethnic styling of English art history in the Loshak Opi exchange, a nativist, elitist, norming of the white upper middle class male, and in this a kind of boundary work, as Hans describes it, although I'd be more emphatic about the social and embodied nature of this boundary. This is really what Nirmal Puwa has identified as the imposition of a consecrated somatic norm within the field of British art history, a subtle means of inclusion and exclusion of racialized and gendered bodies in occupational spaces. Um, Hand, in his article, quotes this uh, 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 rather wonderful um, comment from the late David Mannings um, in his review of um, Painting for Money, in which he uh, identifies the perception of uh, the British, uh, world of British art history being the prerogative of gentlemen, public school and Oxbridge educated uh, 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 patricians moving easily and naturally within the worlds of the nobility and landed gentry. Now, Hans, um, I don't think Hans is quoting this necessarily approvingly, but it's, you know, it doesn't make an effort to test it out. So I thought, well, somebody ought to, shouldn't they? So um, I'm going to wind up by uh, testing that perception out in relation both to the art history establishment and to the civil service that Oppie was part of, and which Hans mobilizes metaphorically. So, um, by the way, there's, okay, so there's, there's this, uh, uh, the uh, Savage article that, that I mentioned, and Oppie appearing as a member of the civil service um, and uh, with a typical um, educational background in that context. Um, and then, so I kind of posed the question, public school educated, Oxbridge educated, at ease with the gentry. I can't explain the methodology fully. <laughs> So this is the Council of the Walpole Society in 1955. Blue means yes, orange means no, grey means not no. So, okay, public school educated, Oxbridge educated. Yeah, probably, uh, probably at ease with the gentry. Um, there's the Board of Education, uh, which you can see in terms of Oxbridge educated about the same. Um, it's possibly slightly more at ease with the gentry. Although, yeah, maybe, maybe there was more risk of meeting people who had not been to public school when you're, in, when you're at work. You know, so... Um, so, uh, and there is the Eden Ministry, which is the sort of, until recent years, the high point of aristocratic privilege in the context of the political elite. Um, and you can see, you know, even, even the Walpole Society and the Board of Education are not quite as elite as uh, the Eden Ministry, but they're not so far off. Um, and then, go the Burlington Magazine, uh, Consultative Committee of the Burlington Magazine, uh, I, the, the orange, who are not public school educated, is generally because they're, they're foreign chaps and they've been educated somewhere else, so I don't kind of compare it. But, you know, heavily Oxbridge educated, you know, similarly to the Walpole Society at each of the gentry. And then we move into a different field, historical journal, um, where there is more Oxbridge educated, less public school educated, much less at ease with the gentry. Past and present, and this was Hans' suggestion, so I did the work, Hans, um, where they're all Oxbridge, but less public school, and they're just, they're just not at ease with the gentry, you know? Um, and what you can sort of map here is a sort of shift in the balance between educational capital and social capital in these different um, contexts. Now, um, so, yeah. So, so English art history is being shaped at its establishment um, kind of in, you might say, in, in, in unusually exclusive terms, even compared to straight art history, even compared between the Burnett Magazine and the field of British art, perhaps. The R.P. Loshak exchange points to a compounding of anti-Semitism and anti-intellectualism, which is surely a recurring feature of cultural life in England, although at once so obscurely and so deeply that even to point this out is to expose oneself to ex accusations of mere tendentiousness. We could point to H.L. Mencken's observation in his book on American English that for, the, for many British commentators, Americans are not in any cultural sense Anglo-Saxons. Most discussions of Americanisms include the objection that yielding to them means yielding to a miscellaneous rabble of inferior tribes, some of them by English standards almost savage, named by Mencken as Patrick Krauss, 
Rastus O'Brien, Ole Ginsberg, or some other such fantastic compound of races, i.e. Jewish, Irish. It may be a point made best and briefly by pointing to the work of another product of the GI Bill in the 1950s, R.B. Kittai, um, who shared um, a similar heritage, Russian Jewish, uh, which becomes, uh, uh, which is referenced in this uh, uh, well-known work from 1960, although started when he was a, a student in the late 50s. And um, the reception of the 1994, the notorious reception of the 1994 Tate show, which uh, Kitai himself claimed uh, represented a kind of deep-seated anti-Semitism within English cultural and critical life, has been well documented, and it's summarized um, in a contemporary comment in the New York Times as a, as a kind of clash of worldviews between the reserved self-deprecatory English and the open Jewish American sensibility. Loshak was, arguably like Kitai, in his self-description, an American bystander and foreign Jew who outstayed his welcome. We could project a speculative history where Loshak did join the art history establishment, enough to do a Girton show at the Tate in the 1980s or the 1990s perhaps, and wonder what the reception of his even modestly Marxist interpretation would have been. Although in some ways we don't really need to speculate because there was David Salkin's Richard Wilson show at the Tate in 1982. I'm not, though, going to end with a suggestion that Oppie's view was necessarily wrong or distorted because of his privilege, nor that Loshak's view was necessarily superior because he was an outsider, and we'd need anyway to qualify to the extent to which he was an outsider. In the matter of Bridge North, Loshak was wrong. The current authority, Greg Smith's online catalogue, is clear that it is on one piece of paper. So should that lead us to dismiss Loshak entirely, as Ope sought to do? Well, I think that is a matter of our own positioning, and whether we are more, oops, sorry, whether we are more interested, uh, so, and whether we are more interested in the questions Loshak was concerned with about the changing status of the artist, the relationship between art and society, economic and, and industrial change, and cultural production, or whether an individual drawing was on one sheet or two. As a very final point, um, a reminder that what played at, plays out in the bubble of English art historical scholarship may have real-world consequences. For Loshak and Loshak's family, it meant that, uh, that the promise demonstrated in 1954 to 55 was never fulfilled. That, perhaps, is damaging enough. Although, if, as appears to be the case, what happened is that Loshak ended up spending the last 20 years of his life in Denmark being a father, maybe that's not such a bad result. The other consequence might, though, be even less forgivable. As savage details, the Board of Education, at the time Oppie served within it, was generally ineffective and sometimes actively obstructive in regard to the occasional political efforts towards educational reform. While there is doubtless more work to be done on Oppie's career at the Board, perhaps against all the odds and evidence he made tremendous efforts towards educational inclusion in his time. What we can say, almost regardless, is that if the civil servants of the Board of Education in the interwar years had spent more time doing their jobs and less time indulging their hobbies, even as noble a hobbyist pursuit as the history of British art, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of British children whose education was truncated in these years might, just might, have faced a different fate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, those were two very different papers, but equally fascinating. Um, I think we're running quite a bit behind, and I can hear the chink of cups of tea. So I think maybe we should just throw it open to the floor and to questions, if that's okay with anyone. I'm sure there must be some after those papers. Ha, hand. If I may, yes, thank <laughs> you. Uh, that was both fascinating papers. And I, and I actually think... You know, thinking about a historic individual like Oppe from such two very different angles, I found it incredibly productive because what one thing that it raised for me is one aspect that I find still extremely striking about Oppe's art historical career. And that is this almost double conscience between, on the one hand side, this deeply aestheticist writer 
who delights in these anachronistic comparisons between British watercolors and, and uh, Chinese art, uh, or indeed um, the, the Greek sculpture lectures that then brim with comparisons to whatnot, Japan and Michelangelo and whatnot. So these, these very intuitive, very, 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 yeah, aestheticist takes on art. And the extreme clerical positivism that marks some of his other published writings. That's something I still try to you know, reconcile for myself, how, how such two very different approaches to art exist next to one another. And listening to both of your papers almost gave me the sense that there is a, a certain dimension of social role play uh, in, included in that, depending on whom you're speaking to. Uh, depending w w when you're amongst your peers who travel the world, you're also uh, uh, operating on a different register, uh, writing about these artworks on a more uh, comparativist, aestheticist level. Well, then again, if it's about demarcating certain social boundaries, both upwards and downwards, both against all these gentlemen connoisseurs, these rich aristocrats who might not care properly about art, but also downwards towards the Eastern Jews, then there might indeed be something like a, like a, like a serious historical positivism necessary in order to demarcate your position in the world. And I find that fascinating to what extent we might get a glimpse of Ope as someone who, who constantly needs to position himself within the social realm that he's inhabiting uh, without necessarily having a clear place cut out, because he's not an aristocrat or something like that who has this clear-cut status that uh, might be quite reassuring, actually. Well, and, and also, I was reminded, you know, the moment when you were talking about his early, the Botticelli book, the Raphael book, and how that was kind of pitched exactly. to an awesome audience, it's also a reminder of, um, you know, you can change over the course of a 30, 40, 50 year career, can't you? Um, and... Um, uh, you know, it's somebody who's kind of trying to find an audience and is writing a particular way, and somebody who in 1955 is kind of sitting on his pedestal. They're, they're different people. And in between, and you know, what, what, what I talked about when we did a workshop here, there was a couple of years ago, is this extraordinary essay from 1934 on early Victorian art, where, I mean, he's a kind of social historian of art without realizing it in, in how he addresses the, um, the context of, of art production in the early 19th century in a way which is way ahead of his time. So you know, clearly, yes, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, in different contexts, you know, we are manifold, aren't we? In, in different contexts and at different times, there's going to be a, 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 you know, a, a, a different positions held. I mean, that was something I, was, I would echo that in terms of the timing of it as well, because the, the period I was talking mostly about was the 20s and the 30s. And that time was a really fluid time in terms of the formation of new ideas. And that's the time when Chinese art really comes into that realm of art history and art theory. And he seems very open to those ideas at the time, but I think by the 1950s, when you're talking about it, he's, he's speaking in quite a different way, isn't he? And I think the fluidity as well between different agents, whether they are um, museum curators, dealers, collectors, it's a much more fluid, open realm, rather than this um, you know, siloing into different disciplines, which mm. seems to be you know, what lots yeah. of people are trying to do in terms of art history as a discipline. Actually, the people who are influencing the emerging trends in the 30s and 20s and 30s come from a whole range of backgrounds and they're working mm. across those disciplines as well. Yeah. And you know, for, for, for boundary work to be necessary, the boundary needs to be under threat in some way. So I guess in 1955, you could have somebody who's claiming, you know, claiming the right to speak for art history because they've got an MA rather than because you know, their, their personal background and their collecting, collecting interests and their, and their character. Uh, it's interesting that you put on that particular period because 55 to 57 was a period of ingrained uh, dispute between Herbert Reed and um, American art writing about what should constitute art writing, a, a model based on Herbert Reed. Reed had gone to America, I think, in 54 to give the Mellon Lectures, which were then published as The Art of Sculpture. And Greenberg posted his repost in early 57, saying, you know, here we have an old world approach mm -hmm. to a modern contemporary kind of topic of sculpture being a kind of practice that's rooted in the new world, not the old world. So I think maybe, obviously, you're dealing with it in different terms and different parameters. But at that moment, the question of who writes 
not the history, but the art writing of the moment, because both were journalistic in many respects rather than art historical. But it, it becomes a key thing between who has the authority to write in an English-speaking context. And meanwhile, Wyndham Lewis had lambasted progress in the arts and made rubbish of Herbert Reed anyway, so... This is just a small point, an observation, but going back to the Loshek opera, um, you said, Martin, they first met, Ope first met Loshek, a much younger man, in 48. Um, so by the time the book appeared, I wonder if there was a kind of deep sense of guilt um, on Ope's part for having recommended somebody who then turned out to be quite the opposite of what he might have hoped. Yes. <laughs> I think yeah, it's the no, short. Exactly. I think, I no, I think, think, I think that's, but, that's, but it that's might help explain that's a, 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 the yeah. overreaction. Yeah, I mean, sure it is quite a vituperative yeah. review. Yeah. And I, th yeah. I think when, it, when he almost apologises, he's saying it's disappointment rather yeah, yeah. than yeah. rancour. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, that's so not spot. really a misjudgment, just disappointing. He let him down. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to ask if, if um, there is anything in the Girton archive at the BM that's further to this, what, what, Lo, what Girton's reaction was to Lo, whether there's any indication that he was slowly starting to agree with Ope, that he, he didn't like his approach, or whether, or whether he was still, he was fine with what um, Loshak was producing. Yeah, there, there is some, for, there, are, there are some Tom Girton notes and comments, which are actually pretty supportive of Loshak, and says right. he was a dream to work with, and you could see that there were some things wrong. Um, I mean, quite what went on, being sent the proofs and then not sharing that with Loshak or sending that on, which I think Ope sort of assumed would happen, though he didn't do it himself. Um, but the other thing I wanted to ask was that throughout your paper, I kept thinking of that review of um, David Salkin's Wilson exhibition. You you referred to it, but you didn't sort of spell it out. And I, I don't know if all of the audience knows that at the time... David was, it, 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 basically, there were vituperative comments. This is in 82, I think, you, yeah. yeah. Um, saying, what does someone from the backwoods of Canada know about British art history, and should he be writing about it? He shouldn't be writing about it at all. Yeah, no, um, yeah, uh, I mean, and that's... Absolutely parallel yeah, yeah, to, and, yeah. but this is in 82. Yeah, I wasn't going to spell it out, but, yeah. you know, there's... there's <laughs> <laughs> As a Canadian, I should. Sarah? So I'm still processing both papers, so it's not um, a fully formed question, but I was just thinking about the work of the archive in doing the, the work that you both presented um, and, and sort of, like, I'm not filling in the gaps, but you know when you have published work and, again, then the, the, in thinking about historiography as well, there's a certain kind of work we do with published art history of a formal kind and exhibition histories as well that are institutional. And then I was thinking how, Martin, as well, your paper is enabled by um, an archive and an exchange, mm. largely through letters at this point, but also you're getting the texture of those, yeah, disappointment, you know, emotion, a fe feeling as well, and how... How we account for that in art history is what we and, and, and uh, you know or how one positions oneself in relationship to another culture and foreignness is something that both your papers made me think about. Sorry, not in a very formed way, but that just again in the context of where we're speaking and the kinds of work we're doing and these larger questions of historiography and its products. Uh, I would agree with that, Sarah, and I think, um, just picking up on your point, I thought it was fascinating, um, having worked on the archives, that, um, Martin, your paper came out of about basically four letters, which I think shows how much you can get, I and mean, the letters mm. are incredibly rich, um, and yours, Helen, came from, I mean, I thought there were just a few scraps of information about Chinese art, but, I mean, that was fascinating, how you pulled all of that together. I have one quick question for you, Martin, because I read those letters mm. a few times, and then before the conference again. And the thing that fascinates me is that um, Ope refers to himself repeatedly in that correspondence as old-fashioned. Mm. I know I'm old-fashioned. He keeps saying it. And, um, and so I was wondering what you felt he thought he meant by that at the time he was writing, whether he understands some of the backdrop that you're talking about or whether he's just referring to his age or whether he's just excusing his bad manners. I don't know. Mm. 
Yeah. No, I, I, I haven't got a, a, a good answer to that other than it's a good question. And I think, I think kind of filling out the, um, the picture of what, what, what did Oppe know of the state of art history in 1955 and what was he reading or aware of? But it's, it's clear there is, it's, I mean, you know, again, it's the kind of boundary work that is actually going to draw up the drawbridge because something is changing. Because this young guy who's got an MA, I mean, had, had he met people with an MA in, with art history before from America? I mean, it was, a, it was a kind of, you know, it was a new world that he was being presented with there, and an and, and unfamiliar one. And not the people that he mixed with at the Burlington or, you know, the Walpole or indeed in the office. So, yeah, that's a good question. I wonder if, oh, one more question, and then, and then we'll break for tea, I think. Yeah, just sort of as a follow-up on this as well, like the richness of archives, especially correspondence and diaries, just restitute that um, personal um, atmosphere um, to, to what, what we are looking at, because we just tend to say, okay, it's a, we're doing art historiography, we're working with people working in institutions, but they are still people, so they have also sympathies and so on. So I just thinking about, um, for instance, Kenneth Clark refusing to write, what well, to support uh, Vin's um, application for becoming professor, um, I think it was in America. And I mean, he had helped him in so many ways, but still probably he just thought that, you know, had a sort of an antipathy, a hidden one that then came through for the papers. But then, on this, I just wanted to ask, out of curiosity to Helen, did Ope have any relationship with Chester Beatty as a person being interested in also Oriental and Chinese um, East Asian I, art? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, he's not mentioned in the archive here, um, but he could have been in those circles. But I think he was more connected to London. You know, every, all the people who are mentioned are very London-based and London-centered. And you've got, Certainly, very well connected at all the all the museums, all the collecting societies. Um, Chester Beatty. I mean, there is a possibility there, but it's not mentioned in the archive, so we'd have to. I'd have to look into it further. I think just as a quick footnote to your, because you talked about Dennis Mann, uh, to remind people that Pevs, Pevsner encouraged Den Dennis Mann in the first place to appreciate Baroque art. I think a mannerism. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I think we should break for tea now. I think, is tea next door, Rella? Downstairs. It's downstairs where you, where you were first thing this morning. So, and I think we've got, how long? Yes, so it's five to four now. Um, so if we can all be back up here by about quarter past four, um, with the ready for the final session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.